Esau, on the other hand, uh, is a guy who said, no, uh, let's see have to respond both to the French assimilation and to, to negritude. Because negritude forced them, negritude kind of, you know, if you're if you Caribbean, you are mixed race already, more so than African. Africans are mixed with everybody is mixed. But if you're Caribbean, you have French uh, blood, you have Indian blood, you have uh, African blood, but also I said blood, I should we really say culture. Uh, so you have those, and you are being asked to still only identify with Africa. So that put Caribbean in a more difficult position, uh, almost in a self-hatred position that Pano analyzed as uh, pathological, uh, you know, in, in black, in white mass. Uh, whereas with Glissant, that's actually something enriching to be of all this uh, mixture, and he calls it Antianite, uh, that is the word coming from the Antilles. You know, but in English we call it uh, Caribbean, but in French it's Lysanti. So uh, Antianite become a, a, a new form of identity for Pisa. So well, you will see later on that Pisa does not even like to fix identities like open identity, we will even see that later on. But he talks about antianite, uh, which some people also call creolite or creolization. Uh, it is more a uh, the theory he developed uh, as a response to negativity. Uh, uh, so so neg when, where negativity asks all the black people to return to the sources, to return to rootedness, uh, to return to Africa, uh, Creole they opened the door for different definitions of the modern black identity. So modernity itself is more, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's more of an interpolation. It's, uh, it, it's more a subject in this and the other people, you know, modern, modernity becomes very important. Uh, so, man not say the definitions of modern black identity in Europe, so that also becomes very important, the Caribbean in North America, black Atlantic, so with this and things that like black Atlantic become an issue, this is way before the world because uh, black Atlantic, uh, black transnationalism, black Marxism, black cosmopolitanism, hybridity. These are all concepts related to, to Islam. While Islam was celebrated by all for this uh, uh, identitarian and multiculturalist movement, uh, he is also very uh, anti essentialist. So, this is important to, to understand about him. Uh, something happened in Pisa that was quite interesting. He, in the 80s, went to the United States and discovered Faulkner's work. You know, and so Faulkner's work grounded in the South, uh, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. He was in New Orleans, particularly. Uh, okay. Brought Pisa to jazz with jazz quite important to the way he was defining his work. That, that becomes very important. Uh, and he sees jazz, having one of the definitions he gave to jazz, uh, he sees jazz first uh, as the first modern uh, music. For him, uh, before jazz, most music was traditional. Traditional, but also belong. Traditional in the sense that the music belonged to uh, a well-defined group, either any aristocratic music or a tribal music or ritual, ritualistic music. Most music before jazz. Jazz was the first, and this is a, is a radical argument that jazz was the first music for everybody. You know. Everybody, you know, if you look at uh, Mozart, it was for 
not only Europe, but different kind of European. But jazz become the first, not only American music, but the first music uh, for everybody. You know, you have uh, white instruments, uh, you have African instruments, you have white songs in it, you have African songs in it. Uh, but the way he played also uh, become the first music, the first modern music, the first music for everybody. And uh, you see traces of European memory in uh, jazz. You see traces of African memory in jazz. This was very important. And, and he developed at this moment what he called uh, the literature of traces. He said Caribbean literature is a literature of tra traces. It's not a literature of identity. It's not a literature of rootedness. But it's a literature that bears the traces of Africa, of the Indians, of Europe, of the modern world. So, it's, uh, so forgetting your past is not the most important thing to to glean uh, because your past can come through your intuition. Your past can come through uh, you know small bits of memory. So he's not too worried about uh, at that. So he explained me that at that. Uh, but more interesting than this song for me, that is what he does. He tried to explain uh, the world. And if we talk about identity, he tried to define identity. Let me, let me get the uh, place quickly. Uh, it's a literature is really a, a, an identity also. We're dealing with, uh, let me find my stage. Just one minute. I'm sorry, I didn't give you a lot of reading on Kisan because it's very important. Because uh, he, he really helps us to go past Fano and uh, Senghor. And as far as he says that, I think we should take him seriously. I'm looking for three things that he tried to pass. One is that it's, it's the idea of nomadic literature. If I don't find them, I'll have to summarize that for you. But it's really nice to read it from your book. And, uh, Yeah. So there is a dualism going on. Uh, it, so 
Lisa looks at the one, the singular, which is more or less the, not only negative, but Western culture. The Western culture passes itself as the culture, so it's singular. Singular also passes African culture as singular. And you go to Africa, he does talk about the besides, but really, he wants everybody to be African and create a universalism from that. And Fanon brings in this uh, dualism. Uh, and even people who came after Fanon, like Paul Bingham, when they talk about hybridity, they are still operating with these oppositions. It's, you know, they have funded their the opposition of this course is at, at, uh, in operation, both in Fort Detroit, when it's a black Atlantic, even though you have lot of identities in it, the identities against other identities. Uh, they operate with different, like the Derivian, different than we talked about. And the Gisan operates with what he called multiplicity. Uh, the, the other thing I have to foreground is that, I don't know if you had a class on Deleuze. Deleuze is really useful to understand in Islam because they were friends and they cited each other and you know they celebrated things together. So if you read the list, the thing that what if you read if you take a class with Michael Hart, I heard he comes here. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a class about the list, uh no, not, yeah not our next class but the one after. Mm -hmm. Well and Hart will be here in that class. Right. Mm -hmm. So I mean how pray and company read the list in a political sense which Makes sense and doesn't make sense. You know, because Deleuze is really talking about, you know, the term that he shares with his is this idea of multiplicity. And, you know, when, when he posits multiplicity, he's not positing it in the sense that you have, uh, because Hart and uh, Nathan, what they do is they take what Deleuze and Gisan call multiplicity. They take them as small resistance groups forming themselves all around the world and finally confronting the capital or capitalism or imperialism of what they call empire. So they are assuming that there is a connection between these multiplicities, like the resistance in Mali, the same resistance as Colombia, as on Wall Street, as in Italy. So that's, that's how they base the multiplicity on these points of resistance. It's coherent, it makes sense, but the, for Deleuze and for Gisa, they're not connected necessarily. I think for Deleuze and Gisa, we need to be cognizant of these multiplicity in terms of identity. Uh, so but when you politicize this, it's very interesting. Because you, know, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to take an author and say, uh, I want to read this exactly that, like the way you wrote it. You can take it wherever you want to take it yourself. But please some part of this nomadic identity. Uh, and, you know, first, let's look at nomads literally. Uh, if you look at, I mean, look at the rooms in Europe. And in my area, you look at the Tuaregs. Uh, and in several places, I mean, you know, uh, you can look at the gypsies and so on. If you look at nomads, first, you do oppose them to say, uh, sedentary people. But they, and the argument of Islam is that sedentary people, when you settle in a place, you fix your identity as well. You fix your identity uh, with that place. You root yourself, you ground yourself. And nomads never settle in any place. So nomads are always erring. Is erring in English? Erre in French. It's that is they're always moving. They're always moving. So they don't have a fixed position. They come to one place and then they go to another place. So that's why he called the literature of errantry. E R R A N T R Y. Usually in English doesn't necessarily mean wandering, it means going in the wrong direction. Okay. So yeah. that's not yeah. that's not <laughs> that's no, but nice you know that but yeah. Yeah. nice going there. Yeah, there's no other good But oh, it, yeah. it doesn't mean necessarily the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Because we did it, 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 the important thing about this and Senghor to do some point, but no was not. But the poets 
And these people are trying to inflect poet, uh, philosophy with poetry. So going in the wrong direction is not necessarily wrong for somebody like this. He said, yes, yeah, sometimes you need to go in the wrong direction. You need to be lost. <laughs> so because they're poets as well, you know. Uh, these are, I mean, these two books that I'm working with, this one is called Poetics of Relation, and this one is called Philosophy of Relation. And in both of them, he, he targeted these people like Plato. He targeted this Western rationality, which says, you know, A, A, B, C, as opposed to, you can confuse A for B, and so on. Uh, so, Aaron's, in that sense, is not totally wrong. He means it to be moving from place to place. But to be lost is not wrong. Uh, so, so this is quite important for Lisa to have more clear. And what he shares with the learners is this idea of reasons, of rhizomes. And what they mean by that? Uh, they are opposing this to uh, the genealogical tree in Western culture and in African culture. First, I mean, before we had thought that the genealogical tree only was in, you know, because when you are in America, you see black American always in roots. You saw movies and all these things tracing their roots. But actually, you can see this is a Western concept. The family tree is a concept for Westerners, when you think about it. So the Africans are borrowing something that's from the West. There is really nothing original about it. And, and, and once you do it, you are also excluding anybody who is not in the family tree. Because the family tree, you know, I was telling you here the other day, uh, a Greek at any time can tell me uh, my genealogy from the ninth century to the present. And when I told, you know, so and so we got some so and so. But how about all the people who are out of it? You know, to people who did fight or people who emigrated, uh, who, who knows? But you do have from this one man, Damon Gile, all the way to yourself. Anybody who's last name is Yawara could do that. So, so uh, what Lisa is saying is that if you have a genealogical tree, you are also saying anybody who's not Yawara is not part of my family. So the genealogical tree. The family tree uh, has its own branches, and these branches exclude anybody else. That's why they choose. So it seems like the three of them are also just talking about your family tree. Yeah. They're talking about other families. Exactly. I'm um, agreeing with you. So, yeah. so where is the difference? I mean, I understand that the Rio is more about like embellishing the story from the narrative, and the family tree is more of this linear. Um, you know, cut and dry, right. Right. Does that make a difference? Well, for me, there is no difference. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the family tree, which is a Western concept, in the U.S. in black studies at some point, they embarked on roots. They are not doing it now, DNA, to, to trace the African uh, roots. And then with the Creoles, with the Sundata ethic that we talked about, they too can trace your roots from your, uh, the first person, they will embellish it, as you said, but they're tracing your roots nonetheless. And for Gisan, all these groups, whoever it is, the black American in the U.S., or the Europeans in, the Euro in Europe, or somebody like myself saying, I know my family from this point, we are all excluding people who are not in these branches of the family. That's what Gisan is saying. That's all based on who, on the tree and the roots of the tree and the branches of the tree. So he opposed rhizomes to that. Uh, and rhizomes or rhizomes, and what, what, what pronunciation do you all Rhizomes. It's rhizomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, uh, so he opposed rhizomes to that. So he says, what happened actually is that we're not dealing with roots. What we're doing is that we're dealing with, yeah. No, 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 I didn't want to interrupt. No, 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 go ahead. It's just the archipelago. Well, well the archipelago itself, we will get to the, archi archi uh, the, 
la pensée archipélique, we'll get to it, you know, yeah, we'll get to it, because it's now rooted, yeah, you know, rootedness is really, uh, Jesus almost never does that, uh, what he does, I mean, every book he, he used to give me, let me see if I have, no, this one he didn't give me, he used to draw in these books, but maybe not this one, Looking it back, maybe I don't know. Philosophy. The way he deals with that, uh, now he doesn't have a drawing in this, but he used to draw things. Uh, after he signs the book, he does a drawing. But it, 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 by reasons, or ra- by reasons, he believes that. Archipel is good in this, because what he does is that human beings uh, uh, do not, at first of all he said that Africa is the, uh, the cradle of humanity. And there were, these people went out of Africa, is not through the branches spreading around the world. African families spreading around the world, otherwise we deal with the tree and the, and the branches and the family tree. What it is is that hum, uh, human nature is has an advocation for errantry, for diaspora, for dispersion. So they find themselves in different places. That's what he's calling uh, uh, reasons. I mean, it's, uh, you'll see it in the film the way he explains it, uh, so that it's not so much the root that. Uh, Send the trees vertically, but these roots are all over the world, and they can come up in different places of the world. So, you know, you have the the islands where human beings come up, and these human beings are not connected necessarily to human beings coming up uh, in America or in Europe or in Africa. So, identities keep going up like that. This is more what both dealers uh, and Lisa are interested in, they're not interested in trees that have uh, unique uh, roots and unique branches. Uh, this, this enables Lisa to go after what he calls multiplicity that we're talking about. Uh, it enables Lisa to go after the openness of identity, the sort of fixing identity. Uh, it, and then we see some to also say identity is always in the making. And that's why you bring this, this idea of nomadic identity. Uh, uh, he, he began to say, well, the problem with negative is I like it very much, but negative seem to close the identity. Then I said, well, what do you think about cosmopolitanism? He said, well, it's the same thing, because cosmopolitanism is saying, I'm from the city, you are not. I have a city civilization and you don't. So any identity that's closed, you turn on again. You know, so this is what Gisan uh, uh, tries to do. Well, let me go through the, this book and tell you some of the things that I like about Gisan. Uh, because just to give you something to hold on to, first Gisan came like Fanon to be acting to negative. So he had theories of realization or Antillian uh, and identity. And then he developed things to this book, what he called uh, Poetic de la Relation, Poetics of Relation. So you see, everything is related, but everything is not related in a family way, but connected, connected and linked. And then he goes to philosophy of uh, relation. So he tried to philosophize what relations, and we'll talk about relations. And then finally he goes to what he calls two more, or one world. One world, it, and I will explain that. So, but for this point, let's hold on to periodization, uh, relation, and uh, one world. These are the different theories that he tried to define. So let's see, what is uh, first relation? I mean, uh, some of the areas where he talks about relations to see if I can give you some concrete uh, definitions of that. He 
here you see, for example, here you compare the rootedness uh, versus uh, errant trees of, of the normandy. So that, uh, in France, you said that you said most of the nations uh, that liberated themselves uh, from colonialism tended to uh, to form the idea uh, of power, the own power, uh, through a root, through an identity. Uh, I think he's thinking about Fanon here. Uh, and now, instead of uh, and did not try to create a relation to the other. You know, what he means by this, or let me, let me read the rest, la pensée qui tuait de soi et de duel opposant les citoyens aux barbares. Okay. So, let's say, country A is liberating itself, and this includes France, it includes any country. You know, if you look at the origin of country, the way in which uh, the countries liberate themselves, they liberate themselves and congeal into a nation by creating the force, the power around how good, how French they are, or how Malian they are, how American we are. We American are like this. So most countries create the power through that by saying we are this. So when they do that, uh, they do it without saying we are this like the Brazilian. We are French like the English. We are French like but they said we are French unlike the, uh, the English. We are, we are Brazilian unlike the Yankees. So you create your power by you know, organizing yourself through the one group and say this is what I have. Most countries do that. And then uh, this word, la pensée culturelle de soi et de So the, the way you thought about you thought about yourself culturally in a dualistic manner. The way you define yourself, the way you think about yourself, you do it in a dualistic manner. That is the one against the other. I against you. Most people did this. And then, uh, this will oppose le citoyen au barbare, opposing the citizen. So you are, if you are an American, you are, a citizen, if you are a Mexican, you are a barbarian. This kind of opposition that we create. If you're French, you are a citizen. Next door, Italians are barbarian or English are barbarian. So he said, citizenship depends on that. Every time we talk about citizenship, we are saying we are citizens against people who are not citizens. Yeah. There's a whole <coughs> propaganda technique that's based around the easiest way to, to solidify a group of people yeah. is to give them an enemy. <laughs> This is more or less what he's saying in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. in, in a different way. Uh, so let's see how far he's going against that. Uh, of the Il n'y a rien de plus massivement opposé à la pensée de l'Iran que cette période de l'histoire des humanités où les nations occidentales se sont constituées puis ont répartité sur le monde. So, it's a if you take the theory of errantry, uh, there was nothing as op opposed to it than Western uh, rationality, Western thought, which uh, was behind uh, Western nations uh, that constitute themselves as the one against the other. And he says that, uh, unfortunately, this is what also was imitated by all the non-Western world, countries of the world. That is, two things happened. Uh, let's say we have France and we have England. And these countries tell the rest of the world to create your nation, you have to be like us. So let's take, for example, uh, Nigeria. They will tell Nigeria, uh, look, we are democratic. We are a nation. 
to decolonize yourself, first you have to go through democracy to create your nation. So it, all around the world, nations were created like that. They are all modeled again, uh, you know, uh, after the, the, the European model. And none of the nations or none of the entities are modeled uh, after what we can call errantry. Nobody can coherently organize something uh, based on errantry. They all organize themselves after this European model, which, is, which opposes the one uh, against the other. But let me keep reading it. Cette pensée de l'errance qui fuit à contre courant de l'expansion nationaliste. So this errantry, which is opposed to uh, the nationalist expansion all over the world, se déguise alors dans les aventures très personnelles. So can only, so errantry can only obtain in personal, uh, individual, uh, experiences. So as a human being, you can be an errant yourself. But once you organize yourself, you are organizing yourself through nationalist precepts. But as an individual, you can be an errant. So uh, this is one of the things. Uh, okay. Tout de même que l'apparition des nations avait été précédée par la dérive des bâtisseurs d'empire. He said, you know, even nations too, they were preceded by, you know, les bâtisseurs d'empire, uh, people like Napoleon, like Christopher Columbus, they, you know, they too preceded uh, 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 nations, just as individuals that we have today who are errands will precede the creation of errantry one day sooner or later. So he says, la racine monolithique est, uh, mon, la racine monolingue, I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday, the mono, uh, monolingue, monolingue is uh, one language, monolingue, uh, and la racine monolingue, avec le troubadour, avec Rembo, L'errance et vocation qui ne se dit qu'en détour. He's defining basically that he says that if you want to know errant, you have to go to poets like Rainbow, uh, you have to go to poets like Segale, and so on. Uh, let me keep going, and I promise to tell you about relations. Okay. What he's telling us that relation, first of all, is best explained by the American world relationship. That's what he means literally by relation. Okay. It's not about relative, but it's about relation. Well, in, in English, relationship too could be uh, about blood relation, but he's not talking about that. What he means is that something, he gave, he gave three words yeah, that are marked. Uh, first word is relative. Relative in uh, uh, relative in French, I think I don't know if it has the same meaning as in English. So let me give it to you first. Relative with an F at the end, uh, but in uh, and it's feminine it be a V E. But relative is some if you relate something to somebody, like if you tell something to somebody, that's what relative means. It doesn't mean uh, relativity. It means something that can be related or that can be told. So that's one meaning, relation, one meaning of his notion of relation. Another uh, meaning is, uh, well, these are all relay. Relay is something passed on. Like I have something, I pass it on to you, you pass it to something else. So that's what relation is also. Uh, and then relate. Uh, something that's commented on. So it is told, uh, passed on, and commented on. That's what he means by the relation. Yeah. It, it, it is kind of dense, I have to admit, but it's also, so in English, in that sense, we can get connotations of linking, we can get connotations of uh, what? Yeah. Uh, you get so you get connotations of linking, connotations of, uh, of uh, uh, connecting, but connotations of also uh, 
being all together, all being in one place. Uh, so that's what he means by uh, relation. That means read and try to translate one of these things. On se retrouve parfois abordant des problèmes de l'autre, les histoires contemporaines en fournissent quelques exemples. Ainsi, il traite les femmes de Martinique à la Dieu, ce qui est là, divisant. So he says, He's still staying with uh, the Aaron tree, but I think he's bored with that. But his argument is that in uh, uh, let, me, let me just read it. Seeking, searching for the other, identifying with the problem of the other. Uh, and then he gave us the example of Fanon in Algeria. You know, he said that's what relation is. You seek the other. And this is very different from what we saw in the Holy Baba Guide and Spirak and their reading of one. They're not seeking the other. They, on the contrary, they're opposing themselves to the other. Whereas the relations make you look for the other. You know, the relations make you search for the other. The relations make you identify with the problem of the other. And he gives an example which is kind of odd for me. He said, for example, Fanon in Algeria. He went to Algeria, most people pay attention to him giving up his French citizenship, but he's also seeking Algerians. He wants to be with Algerians. Uh, and as I wrote in English, yeah, this positive, uh, this positive identity, not in roots, but in relationship generated through identification. Like Saint Paul said, being born in the other. That's the note that I put here. So I think he said himself that we should often translate the relation, the relation with the English word relationship or identification. So that this becomes important for him. Uh, let me go with this. But I, I, does that, that make sense at all? Yeah. Okay. It, it, it makes, because I think for me it was you know, sometimes I think something is very important, but you, know, you talk about it, it doesn't seem like it makes any sense. <laughs> you know, but because for me this passage makes a big difference between Fanon and uh, and Lisa and Sengo. Because Lisa is also always looking for the other. You know. Senghor is always being the other, he's born in the other. Mm -hmm. But Lisa is looking, Lisa wants to be related. Because what, by being related, you create poetry, because you are imagining what the other is. It's this poetic uh, relation that Lisa is interested in. By seeking the other, it makes you write a lot, it makes you say a lot. Whereas Senghor, when he sees you, he believes in a presence, in magic, in spirituality. He, uh, he is you right away. Uh, and then Fanon is saying, uh, we are the other, uh, the Europeans are enemies, they colonize us. Gilisan said, you're looking for the other. You are being, you want to relate, be related to the other. So this relation is not based on blood relation, it's based on poetry. That, I think that, I thought I was finding something interesting there, but when he explained it, it's not as that you know, but I thought he was doing something interesting there. Okay, but let's keep going, uh, yeah, no. No, uh, I have, I mean, maybe it's, it's like, um, like here I find a sense of family. Right? Yeah, exactly. Here. Whereas that's like, the song. Right. Yeah. So I'm finding relations here whereas I like yeah. my background is part Sami, like black Norwegian, like black Flanders and so it's mm. moved here, mm. right? But yeah. I have no connection to this, right? So that's exactly what Lee is talking is, about. Yeah. He would say, I speak your language, I speak all your languages. Yeah, I don't need to know uh, Norwegian to speak Norwegian. Yeah. You know. So because he became a poet, he began to imagine because the imaginary this is another very difficult word of a uh, in order to, to relate to people you don't you don't need to be blood related you don't need to know them but you can imagine knowing them you can imagine relating to them yeah so is he claiming that 
claiming that you actually, in some way, genuinely connect to the other person, or that poetically, you could genuinely poetic, and through everyone actively sort of treating poetry as a more interesting or connected world, what like, what would it be? Well, it, he's saying that everyone actually is connected. We have to look for those areas of our connection. Senghor projects himself into you right away, uh, feels you, uh, knows you, you are him, he's you. Uh, this man relates to you, uh, gets to know you slowly by creating poetry about you, uh, I mean, he doesn't literally write poems about you and so on. So his relation is, ima- is grounded in imagination, his relation is grounded in uh, uh, in poetry, because he's trying to say that Plato didn't get it, because Plato, when Plato kicked out the poets from the cave, or for, from the Republic, he didn't get it. Poetry is actually the only, I use your word here, the only genuine thing that can bring us together. Politics cannot bring us together. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know, religion cannot bring us together. Senghor is closer to religion, but poetry can bring all of us together. Because poetry does not place any obstacle to the imagination. And I would say, you know, uh, there is this word of Gleason that I have a problem uh, translating, uh, especially in a place like this where, you know, you all have been dealing with Lacan and then you have been dealing with uh, different uh, German philosophers. That Gleason has, and dealers too, they have this word called l'imaginaire. Imaginaire is translated by psychoanalysts here, the Freudians and so on, as the imaginary. The language and the post structuralists everybody translates the French imaginaire with uh, the imaginary. So they have, you have imagination, you have image, and you have the imaginary. But the imaginary in English is, again, we go to Aaron Trips. It, to err is like be lost, to be lost. You even have the word error in it. You see? The ima- imaginary also in, in English connotes the idea of being uh, telling stories, the idea of, uh, you know, this is just fiction, and it's just in your mind. And then if you put it in academic terms, uh, recent academic terms, I'm not saying all along, but in the last maybe 25, 30 years, the imaginary has become something that you oppose to the symbolic. You remember in Lacan, you have the symbolic and the imaginary. But that, this does not mean neither, neither one of these. What do you mean by imaginary? Uh, Adikar actually gave me a good definition of it. He said he means more what John Lennon, John Lennon is saying, imagine in this song. So that's, and that's probably the closest. You imagine a world. Because at least I mean in the film, he'll tell you, you can't, you can't tell people to start being terrorists. You can't tell people to, to change the imaginary. You can't tell Christians, see this like this. You can tell you know, Muslims, see this like this. But you can, tell, you can tell people slowly to imagine another world. So the imaginary for this is very important in that sense. But unfortunately, those of us who write in English, we don't have a good translation of, of this word. Because if you say imaginary, then all your colleagues would be psychoanalysis and philosophy. They would say, this is what you mean. But that's not what you mean. So I think that's a look. The word really means what John Lennon said, imagine. And I think that's pretty correct. The French imaginary become imagined. But then, as I ask, I say, well, what is the noun? And that's the verb. But is it a verb without a noun? Because, you know, what is it? Because you have to say imagination. And in fact, I think the imagination is closer to the meaning than imaginary. So uh, this is another uh, important concept to him when he's talking about relation. Let me see more about relation. There are a few words that kind of fit into that one. Uh, uh, like the ones that come to mind would be like paradigm or epistemology. 
paradigm in the epistemology are coming from history of science. Yeah. They're coming from history of science, that means that they're not poetic. They, they're talking by different breaks. <laughs> they, they, they're too silent and too strong, you know. You know so uh, the epistemology, as you said, you know, is the epistemic, uh, you know, in paradigm, yeah, but he, he getting into rationality. And once you get into rationality, you lose the subject because he's thinking poetry. He's trying to explain the world through poetry. That's why this one is, you know, and then you have to interpret his scientific writing as a poem. I think that's why he's difficult in many ways. Uh, he says, La Pancette de Pédé, La Rencontre. So the meeting with the other is important with him. There is a meeting, uh, quite important. L'imaginaire et la connaissance poetic. Poetry is important. And uh, being of the West. Bilsan says he is a Westerner. Again, he is a critic of the negative movement. Uh, but he is critical of the West. Yeah, more and more, I think she's negative more and more. I mean, there are, of course, black people who still want to return to Africa. But more and more uh, black intellectuals are claiming themselves of the West, but they are critical of the West. They don't buy into the major paradigms of the West, but they are of the West. And I mean, you can see the same thing in Israel. You know, with Jews, they are Jews that claim themselves of the West, even though they stay critical, and they are Jews who return to Israel. I think that paradigm is quite important for understanding uh, the, uh, the black paradigm here. Uh, let me see if I can find I should skip everything and just go to relation, unless we said enough about it. Let me see. Are these translated into English at all? Yeah, it is this one that's translated, Poetic of Relation. This is not translated yet. Uh, because, again, I tell you to translate here, we have to struggle with how to translate words that like imaginary, words that like relation. Right. Uh, only a poet, if you if you poetic, you can translate it, I think. You know, because you have to let yourself go and completely uh, appropriate him. And so this is what I think he's saying, and do that. Otherwise, I don't know. Uh, and in fact, that's why many people take his ideas, run away with them, yeah. uh, because he's not translatable in many ways. Yeah. Uh, and the is translatable, the next two is very difficult to translate, you know. Yeah. There, there is one book I w- I've been looking at from um, Michael Dash. Yes, he's my colleague at NYU. Okay. He did the Caribbean discourse, the Antillean discourse. What is the title of it? Uh, it's what they found. I think he's more about like a, an anthology or something. Okay. No, but he also translated uh, the discourse Antillean. If, if you put discourse Antillean, uh, yeah, this poor Antillean discourse. Yeah, did you say Cambry studies in Africa and Caribbean? Oh, no, no, maybe it's not. Yeah. Anyway, he's your colleague. Yeah, he, 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 he did that translation. I am looking for all words of relation that we can. Relation is also tradinion. Tradinion is uh, translated as hyphen. You know, so instead of putting the hyphen between black America and he can put hyphen between you and everybody else. So this hyphen is important to him. It's a trait in you, the, the dash. We are all connected by dashes. Talking about Michael Dash. So uh, the relation is trait in young. Who did work for translation? <laughs> it's a corny pop culture thing. They just started adding 
letters afterwards. Yeah. Like some nouns and then some verbs. Uh -huh. Okay. Let me see again if I'm going to disappoint you because I could see a big word. This is on relation. Let me read it. This is the next sentence. I really think I'm very excited. But we explain it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But let's see. This time. Yeah, I'm afraid it may not make sense, but let me, let me read it. La passion non perçue, si difficile pourtant à soutenir de ses humanités, tout d'abord vers la conscience de la totalité monde et en même temps vers les acceptances de la différence et les différents formats. First translation is going to be very hard. So why did I put pieces? So let me, let me see who it is. It may not be a good pieces here. Uh, set, set, uh, to, 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 yeah. Pourtant, nouvelle région du monde qui ne s'agira pas d'explorer, mais où nous entrons, ancienne découvrir et ancienne découvert, ancien colonisateur et ancien colonisé, sans que pas un avantage de connaissance. Ok, I think what I was trying to say, I had read before that in, in Gleason's idea of relation, all the objects are related without hierarchy, without one being superior to the other. So all the human beings become related would have having what he called uh, well, so now I can translate it, have having prefaced it like that. Uh, he is saying, let me begin with a sentence. So this, this is another thing about this thing, because this whole thing is a sentence, you know. So <laughs> so let me see where I can start. Uh, it is different and tant que tel et même temps vers à la fois diffacté. Toutes ces passions qui sont autant dans All these passion, which is also tension. So this is the way you write. Passion, which is tension, uh, prefigures in a universe where the geography uh, and physical uh, regions are little known. Okay. And then after you say all this passion that attention you say all that at the same time all these new regions of the world that we, we are not going to explore, but where we are entering, we the ancient uh, discoverers of the world, and we also who are discovered by other people, we the ancient colonizers of the world. And we are also the ones who are colonized. He wants all these sanctuary, pas and avantage, the connaissance. He wants all these people to be come together without one having the advantage of knowledge bigger than the other one. So when we come to this level, we are all even. You know, I'm not a professor, you're not a student, we all get related. This is one of them. So, uh, so I put put Jesus, but it needs a lot of prefaces. There's another place where I put big, big relations, so let me read it and see. And, and this is the problem with poetry also. You read it one day, you think it means one thing, and then you read it the other day. <laughs> That's a good at But anyway, that is what he says here. Yeah. No, our, our thoughts, our reactions, the most unexpected, the most secret also. Uh, as, uh, our inspiration and our inventions have been this, uh, at the same time expressed and uh, presented somewhere uh, through our spaces, far away in languages that are the strange. So whatever you feel, whatever you think, whatever you express in your language, has been expressed in another language as well. So this is another way of relating you to the other person. Le forme le plus étrange qui leur a
by people who are unknown to you that you will never get people you will never get you will relate it to. Uh, I think it's again going against the negative. Perhaps the best thing is to show the film and then come back and discuss the film. Maybe that way you will get to like this one because I don't want to take the risk of making you not like this one if they all know that guy is too difficult. Because when I was making this film, here is what I told him about. I traveled, I traveled with him from Southampton in England in the boat all the way to New York. So five, six days on the boat, ocean, nobody else. And I told him, I said, look, Edward, you have to talk to me as if I were 12 years old and explain your ideas to me. And I gave him the, the example that, you know, the New York Times, a lot of people respect the New York Times, the ninth grade can read the New York Times. If you are, you know, so I want you to give me ideas that Everybody can understand. He said, well, you know, you have to, uh, he didn't like to travel by plane. So he said, I'm taking the boat. If you want to do that, you have to take the boat with me. So we took the Queen Mary uh, from Southampton all the way to New York, to Brooklyn. And I, you know, and I only was the first two and a half, three days, Gleason, was not feeling well, and every time I go to him to you know, his side, camera side, he would say, oh no, I'm too tired, oh, I'm so cold, I can't do anything today. So first day, I said, well, that's normal. Second day, I said, that's normal. And then I began to worry, I said, oh, I get it. On this boat, you can't call anybody because uh, you know, there is no, it's like being on the plane. Uh, and this guy suddenly doesn't want to be interviewed, what am I going to do? So it became a big, big deal. Uh, but after the third day, he began to talk to me, and everything went well. Uh, so what? What? Uh, the film really originated in uh, the idea originated in my desire to invite him to NYU at my center to spend a month. And then he says to me, he said, "Look, I." I can't speak English. He spent 20 years in the U.S. and he refuses to speak English. The English is too simple. So he refuses to speak English. And uh, I, I wanted to expose his ideas to the New York community. So he said, well, how are we going to do it? I'm not going to speak in English. So I said, okay. Let me interview you now, and then I will film it. And during every session, I would say 15 minutes. And the 15 minutes, uh, I bring people who are experts of your work and we'll discuss it. He said, yes, but I'm not, I can't be interviewed here. I'm going to France, but if you want to read, if you want me to sit down, you have to come with me to France, and then we take the book. So that's one of the privileges of being a professor. I could do that. I said, okay, I think that, that's okay. So I did that. Uh, and then after that, I went with him to Martinique too. So that's really the film. Yeah. There's a question about those 20 years he spent in the U.S., you said? Like? Writing and teaching. Oh. So it goes so, you know, he teaches uh, either the spring or the, the fall. And it goes back. He had three rooms, had a room in Paris. And go in Martinique and the New York place. It's incredible that he refuses. He, he, refuses he understands every word he says, but he refuses to speak English. Because, because I think in from that generation of French people, uh, he doesn't like to make a, mistake, a grammatical mistake. So he'd rather not speak the language at all. Uh, what I you know, I think English is easy because any, anybody, everybody can speak English. But he doesn't, he, he's still thinking in the mode of Frenchness or Francis and God says it. So he doesn't want to say, je ne vais pas me ridiculiser, je ne peux pas parler anglais. You know, so he just tell you that. I said, okay. So that's how we made the film. You know, 
we did uh, I organized a conference, I mean about four conferences on different aspects of Gisan's ideas. And then I projected on the screen and Gisan himself is sitting like a king. And then at the end people come and say, This is what Gisan did. He, 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 his reactions were the following on the word imagination. He said, Why do you translate this as imaginary? It's not imaginary. That's not what I mean. So, so and so on. So that it kind of thing. But I see the film and then uh, we talk about it. I think that's the 